Hi everybody, welcome to Tea and Trails. I've got to do the pre-pre-pre-entry, as we call it. I'm still here. God, I still feel tired, Gary. This is endless. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to wind a bit in this podcast just to make everybody feel better about themselves, generally. So let's go. Episode nine, nearly double figures. I can't believe it. All the usual podcast shenanigans, brew the coaches about managing injuries from an emotional level. We catch up with our attrition podium finisher and one of my dragons back race tent mates, Robin Cassidy. I'm looking forward okay. to that. Tales from the Trails, our lucky pole competition winner is announced. And we have another competition from a podcast partner, Active Root. Amazing. Almost 10 episodes. We always, we said at the beginning, Gary, did we say on the podcast? Can't remember. Such a long time ago. So much has happened. Yeah, I think we did. We said we would do 10 and see how it was going, whether we could manage it, whether we could make it sort of time and financially viable for us. So we haven't discussed this. This is live, guys. This is live. What we've done is, <laughs> is it, is it, um, what is it? Love at first sight. No, married at first sight. Oh my God. First date, one, one, one of the young, first um, When they go, I saw Shanice, are you going to stay with Big Hunky Mark or are you going to leave? And Shanice is secretly having an affair with Craig, the Australian builder. Anyway, sadly, none of that's happening in our lives, but we've written on a piece of paper if we're going to do another 10 episodes. We're going to hold it up live. If you're watching on YouTube, this is... We've got YouTube. Episode. If you're not, really, so, <laughs> this is really well. <laughs> It's a tactic to drive our YouTube views up. That's all. Is it? I thought it was just really fun. <laughs> okay, ready, Gary? Are we going to do 10 more? Are we going to hold up? I'm going up. <laughs> oh. Gary said, you betcha. And I said, no. Oh. <laughs> Jokes. I did another one. Uh, says, yeah. <laughs> Awkward. Get you going. Awkward. I'm, I'm such a tease. Not I'm such a tease. <laughs> We're going to do 10 more. Are we, Gary? Oh, my God. Yeah. It's a lot, Gary. We've scheduled a few guests, so I'll be oh. mind. <laughs> it is a lot, but it is a lot. But I'm really enjoying it. And it's funny, I bumped into a friend at the weekend, and uh, she said how much the show is better than our old podcast, which, yeah, I, it did make me think about. And she said, you can feel your sense of ownership. That's what... Oh, oh yes, I do feel that. I do feel... Yeah. I think we can say that without getting into trouble. Yeah. Um, and I also feel like... Um, I love, like, even though it is, a, I talk, stop saying this, Eddie, but it is a ton of work and a lot of like stuff to remember, isn't it? You and I like WhatsApp and go, have you done that? And when you're working with someone else as well, I guess there's that other bit of like, what have you done? But we're good, aren't we? We're, like, we're, you're so good, Gary. Very good and team. I just, and I kind of just try and help as much. You're so patient and understanding. And you, and I'm always the one that says, can we change this? Can we do this? And you're always like, yeah. Yeah, but it, I don't think it would work otherwise, would it? Because if you oh were like, goodness. I'd be like, I'd have to be that. I'd be like, Gary said something nasty in the office. <laughs> but um, I love, I just, yeah. And as it grows, this podcast more and more, the community and the messages and getting messages, especially for women. I feel I've got a real platform now since the spine for women, for mums and getting those messages, uh, people slipping into my DMs, which I'll never get bored of saying, um, <laughs> sending messages about how the podcast has inspired them or changed them or it just keeps them being active or they've sent it to their partner, all sorts yep. of stuff like that. The value of the podcast then is you can't value that. That is what I want to do with my life. And last week's show too. I've had so many people slipping into my DMs. Oh. <laughs> It's not just all about you, Eddie. And guys, too. Guys took something from that uh, podcast we did on the menopause. So thanks, yeah, thanks for Siobhan for sharing all, loads and loads of good stuff. And I'm boosted on my vitamin D, and hopefully, yeah, feeling, yeah. I do you know? I since I listened to Siobhan, I went. I was like, right, come on, Eddie, you've got to sort yourself out. So I cooked all my meals for the week because I was single parenting. I made sure that I had tons of protein, loads of whole grains, loads of fruit and veg. Got back on my multivitamins because I won't lie, I'd let everything slip. In order to feel better, you've got to look after yourself a bit better. So she inspired me too to come on, shake out of it. How are you, Eddie? How's your week been? So we're week three now. I've got the weeks, so I've got it sorted post oh, fast, isn't it? I've learned so much. I think I need to do a whole podcast on recovery. <laughs> Um, I have learned so much in this recovery process because I've never recovered from a race of that distance. And and also it's so individual as well. So even though I've had clients that have done races of that distance, um, uh, it, it's quite individual how you're going to recover. And I've seen on Strava, you know, obviously other people have recovered much quicker 
or have they? I'm still very much, yeah, I've had a few real lows, Gary, to be honest, because I feel I'm in this... Um, if you ever had a baby and you've had that first 12 weeks when you feel exhausted, oh my God, I suppose I'm pregnant. I mean, it would be an impossibility, but um, the first 12 weeks when you're totally exhausted, you can't do it by the evening. You're like just lying on the sofa. You just want to eat beige food. And then, and also you have like, unless you keep eating all the time, you have like these real energy slumps and you feel a bit sick. I feel like that. That is how I feel. So I'm trying to be really like mindful of keeping the calories going in and keeping the snacks there all the time. So don't hit that energy low and that's really helped as well um and oh now with the spine our listeners if any other I've listeners seen a few didn't... posts on facebook so people saying like appetites are still all over the place like yeah. suddenly starving and i do think that's probably a real hormonal um the hormones are still all over the place and so it's uh the body's like not sure and i know when people talk about um you know often if they've had some sort of suppressed appetite for whatever reason the body often then keeps telling itself it's hungry even though you know it can't be because it's not sure when it's it's sort of flight or fight isn't it it's not sure where the next food is coming from so i feel a bit like that i do feel much better i just feel i did three runs last week on the snow which is actually really nice because it's soft and there's no you know it's totally like the foot is always landing in the same place there's no rut so it's not like running on a trail uh it was just freaking freezing (laughs) which isn't good when your tendons and ligaments and everything are stiff and sore and you will sort of want to warm up into it and it's minus 10 and you're just your whole body is like that doesn't anyway, sound like every fun. every time i do i do like 30 40 minute run i feel much better afterwards and then the next run i feel better definitely not ready to run and i don't want to run every day and i don't want to really run any further and i do feel with the running every time i go running it sets me back slightly i feel like the body goes into like what, what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing we're not ready for this uh, but i feel so good and i've got the dogs i need to go for a run so I'm just going to keep tinkering it and reminding the body that that's his job. That's what we do. I eat and drink like I've been on a long run, basically. That's what cool. it is so bad. Um, skiing feels great. I've done lots of skiing with the kids, which is a lactic burner in itself, trying to keep yeah. up with that. And I've done three ski tours going uphill with the dogs coming down is hilarious. I think I posted a video on my Instagram and they're right under my ski. <laughs> and Taka always barks because she loves the zoomies down. So she's like, Ooh. and so Lindy's like, oh, we bark when we go downhill. Do yeah. <laughs> like at my feet and on Sunday, I was like, right, I'm going to, wanted to ski with the kids in the afternoon. So I was like, okay, I'll do a quick up with the dogs. I kind of forgot the weekends. Loads of people used to track more than during the week. And it was really, really icy. And it's quite a narrow track. And I had both, the, I had my really light flappy skis on, I had both the dogs under my skis. And I had all these people like coming up the track. And I was like, oh, the st- was lethal. <laughs> it was lethal. And, um, and I, so I had to kind of like keep like, I was like, I cannot ski like on the edge anymore. And I got both dogs. I saw the trees coming close to me a few times. I was like, we were going to do another up. And I was like, do you know what dogs? I don't think my heart can take it because I almost fell in the forest a few times. So um, (laughs) then it was fun and the dogs love it and they get really tired. So hopefully, sadly, it's not sadly, but it's the kids half turn this week. And so not lots of time. So little short bits of of exercise is what I'm trying to do at the moment. I am going to start lifting some weights again in the next few days. And that means that I actually have to put my spine kit away. I'm writing a big document all on my spine kit, um, which we're going to do a podcast on next week. And I'm going to put something on Facebook about questions you might have and and questions for Gary too not it's not it will be spine focused on the kit that you need for spine but it will also be on like mountain kit running kit stuff that works for us that sort of stuff as well so I'm writing a big document at the moment not just for me I'm actually working with James Elson too um for the Centurion store he's done a huge video all about the spine kit which I'm helping him do at the moment that's going to be so handy so yeah getting there slowly so so I'm better I'm better but so gosh slowly slowly patience patience you know my big virtue patience um how do you feel a maybe a bit too early to talk about this but how would you feel a I always get like a void after a big race, a bit of a mm. bit of a down that kind of 
horse race you know, blues. I haven't, I haven't got that at all because I'm just so happy that I did it and I don't have to do it again. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> I'm just so happy that I did it. I think the podcast really helped fill that void as well because off that, we've had quite a lot of work. We've been quite busy, haven't we? So I haven't really got, and I'm just, you know, I had so much training for it. And so I'm just so happy that I don't, that that's done and I can revel in. And I think it really helps that I'm in the mountains as so I can ski and I can, you know, I'm filling my time doing lots of lovely stuff, keep stopping to have cake and stuff. Maybe it will come and maybe it will come when I try to rebuild fitness rather than just rebuild m- movement. And I realize that it's going to be a bit of a slog, but I always quite enjoy the rebuild stage. Do you? Did, did you like, enjoy these um, other activities? Like for me, if I was thinking, okay, now maybe I should be on the bike or on the turbo trainer, I wouldn't really enjoy that as much as running, but yeah, you to get as much from skiing as uh, you do. Yeah, I love, I love any, as long as I can move, I'm always happy with that. What about you, Gary? Ooh. Another, pretty good. (laughs) With the dates again, eighty miles of dragons back training, two strength sessions down the gym. I think I did one or two mobility sessions or the core sessions at home. They were good. I'm pretty sure, um, and you'll agree with this that don't lift heavy before. Although the marathon wasn't a race, but yeah, I shouldn't have done it the day before a marathon because I had serious, serious bum ache um, from <laughs> all those uh, squats. Yeah, that that, uh, that that didn't go too well. Stride session and a minute session. So starting to get a little bit more focus. I'd say as far as the training week's concerned, that's a solid uh, seven, six and a half, seven out of ten. Oh, and also, which is good. I would get more than that. I think well, strides are... Strides are not so good, but the the, the minutes, you know, you think it's only a minute, but wow, we were pretty huffing and puffing at the end of that minute. And then it was like a, a walk for the group to get back together. And then we jogged out until the uh, minute beeped to go again. And yeah, I enjoyed that. One of our coaching questions coming up, it's about uh, when you reintroduce training after maybe a bit of a, a, a dip in training. Yeah, I've been scared to run fast and what that's going to feel like. And this week I've got cross country the weekend, so I'm a bit <laughs> well, nervous. I going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to find out what happens there. And yeah, my heart rate variability has been pretty steady so yeah and also i've been boosted up with uh, loads of vitamin b and d so feel and hopefully sound a bit better than i have been for the last few weeks but the northeast marathon club yeah the nemac marathon that was really good because i got to see some friends that i hadn't seen since probably before covid um i think i bumped into some at park run but my running and entering events has completely changed probably similar to a lot of our listeners where i used to I was chasing 100 marathons for a long time. So it would be pretty much sometimes it'd be every weekend I'd be running a marathon. And then since COVID, it really knocked my race habit. Feels like this year is quite busy again, but they're more big days out in the mountains as opposed to just uh, racking up the miles on the tarmac. So it was nice to catch up with some people. I had forgot how tough a tarmac marathon is on the body. Very slow, very chatty. I can't, you know, the pace was good. It was pasty pace or fruit, fruit pastel pace or whatever, jelly tot pace. Sorry, that's what I was eating, an active fruit. So it was very slow and sociable. But yeah, I pulled up pretty sore on um, Sunday, all aches and pins. But it was good and it was a good nutrition test because the pace, we, I think it was Tom Holland's was saying pasty pace. It was probably like ultra effort, like 100 mile effort if I looked at my heart rate. And yeah, I was guzzling active route for five hours and uh, just raw sugar with jelly tots and no tummy trouble. So yeah, it was good. And I loved it. You know, where I live, just running up and down. Well, I'll be, pref- if I'm being honest, I prefer to be south of the Tyne, being a more of a Sunderland fan. But uh, yeah, running, running up and down the Tyne <laughs> was wonderful. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Really nice. But no market. You know, I mentioned, I hope there was going to be this um, uh, oh, a market to get a nice burger or something yeah. after the race. What, what was your post-marathon snack? We went to um, Tim Hortons, the, it's like a, it's a Canadian burger joint. And I had some apple fritter and it nearly finished me off. It was so heavy and sweet. And I've got such a sweet tooth. That's how sweet this thing was. But yeah, really good. <laughs> apple fritter post-marathon. <laughs> I know, yeah. High quality nutrition. <laughs> We've got a new partner for the podcast, a company called Protein Rebel. Now, I found these when I was doing my research for protein, um, and I found they've got the vegetarian protein powder, which was good. Uh, and so I reached out 
and they agreed to uh, come on board and share with us a 15% discount code for our Patreon members. And it's good. It's a site-wide code. There's no minimum spend, um, but a bit of a downer. They don't ship overseas yet, so we've still got that problem. I think they're supposed to be after Brexit or something. Yeah, is a girl supposed to get her protein right now? <laughs> well, what has happened, also another uh, nutrition company, Vela Forte, are going to send us out some bits of bugs, and I know they do ship overseas. So if uh, we like their products and we want to share a discount code with you guys, we'll and they like working sent, with us. We'll get it all sent again to Colonel and Mrs. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Edwina, and... Um... <laughs> They'll, they'll go, well, these Vela Fortes. I mean, they were chewy, but really nice with a, tea, with a cup of tea at 11. Gosh, I did the gardening after that really fast. That lawnmower. <laughs> well, good. Their snacks, though, look super tasty. So I'm looking forward to trying those guys. But yeah, if we like them and they like us, um, hopefully we can share some discount codes for our overseas Patreon members, which would be awesome. Big news too, Eddie, in the podcast world. What? What? We made wait. it. <laughs> I'm always, you know, I do the heavy filter. But UK uh, running, if I could filter a trail running too, I'd do that, but it's not so oh, specific. Oh, I thought it was on trail running filter. Oh, I see, yeah, it's just running. Hello, hello. The heavy flex where we are. But I looked in the, um, just the sports charts, and I think it was your wonderful <laughs> spine story that you shared really uh, did wonders for the podcast because we were in number 62 and I, you know, you said number 62, is that something to brag about? But when I look at the sure, company, that we keep, yeah. <laughs> but when I look at the company that we kept, um, yeah, I was super pleased with that. And what I did notice, and this shouldn't be the case, but basically the sports charts were full of men talking about football. There's a few different podcasts yeah, popping in there. So not much diversity, but some of these companies, you know, they were backed by big, big brands. And um, for us to be in in the mix there, I was super pleased. So, yeah, well done, Eddie. Well done. Backed by PG Dips and... Uh, <laughs> Jelly Tots. You and me. <laughs> well done, Gary. That is good work. Let's keep it up. Yeah, good, good week. This week's Brew with the Coaches, we have a question from Raven Welsh. Quite emotional, this question. I think we all like felt this question. Uh, so we send you big love again. And anybody who's injured at the moment and is listening to this, perhaps they want to be running and they're not. Oh, it's rubbish. I hear you. I hear you. But it will pass. This too will pass. So we always remember that. How do you manage an injury on an emotional level and manage to keep your morale up? Well, lots of different advice from all of us, Raven. So hopefully this will not only help you, but anybody else at the moment who's on the subs bench. This week's Brew with the Coaches question comes from Raven Walsh. And this is a question I think we can all identify with. Um, Raven is currently injured and finding it really hard mentally. She's doing lo- all the stuff you're meant to do, seeing a physio, doing the exercise, etc. But she is not coping with it emotionally and finding it really hard, not knowing when she'll be able to run again. She's avoiding social media because she's jealous, seeing friends runs when she can't get out. And she's becoming a bit of a rec- Clues. Her question is, how do you manage injury on an emotional level and manage to keep your morale up? Raven, first thing we're going to do is all four of us is send you a big hug. Yeah, big hugs, Raven. Big hugs, Raven. Sorry. We'll get through this. You will get through this. And the most important thing is not to become a recluse and to keep talking to people that this is the (laughs) way that you feel. And your run buddies will tell them that you want to do other stuff together but even if it's just going to cafes uh going to the cinema do not be at home that's the worst thing that you can do is to uh shut everything out because the running world though it carries on when we're not in it which is horrible because you think everybody should stop um it will be there for you when you are feeling better i think the biggest thing we've all been injured is to have a plan the biggest thing and that's the hardest thing sometimes is when you're injured especially if you don't know what the injury is or how long it's going to take to heal that is rubbish as runners but have a little plan do whatever you can movement wise and there is nearly always movement that you can do unless you're you know broken back there is always something that you can do and it might not be what you want to do and this is hard when you're injured uh because i don't want to go and aqua jog in the swimming pool that takes hours i don't want to sit on a bike i don't want to do this hiking 
I don't want to go to the gym, but you know what? It's not about like at the moment. <laughs> Sadly, you have to just t- swallow the pill and g- focus on what you can do. I think you're totally right to come off social media and Strava and all those sort of things, but they're not making you feel good. You have to really focus on what is helping you get through this and set yourself little goals. It can be something really simple, like, okay, I'm going to learn to do a pull-up and buy a pull-up bar uh, and fix it on your door <laughs> and teach yourself how to do pull-up bar, how to do some press-ups. Uh, join a gym if you've never joined a gym and work on some upper body. Teach yourself to aqua jog. There's always something that you can do. It take that bit of extra oomph that you need to find when you're injured to get yourself out of the fug is the hardest bit. But then once you get yourself out of the fug and you start moving again and you focus on something different other than running, you will start to feel better and you will start to heal because positivity is a big part of healing a running injury as well and movement. So I would say Raven, try and look to the towards the rainbow and see what you could find. And <laughs> hopefully in a bit of movement um, and with a bit of tea and trails love, you'll find something. Hopefully by the time this goes out, you'll feel a little bit better anyway but don't feel that you're alone because you're not because every single runner every single sports person um has been in that uh has been in that book and so we send you lots of love my top tips 100 for for getting through this is if you can't run volunteer volunteer at races you know um one of the best the best things I've done when I'm not racing is volunteer at events because it's so positive. And actually when you're being positive for other people, it pulls you up. So, you know, actually being, being supportive of others is a great way to elevate your own um, enthusiasm for stuff. You know, and one of the great things about running is that you don't actually have to be a runner. You could be supportive and help other people. And, you know, those people at the checkpoints, I mean, you know, it's the the spine last week, the volunteers are fantastic. They make a huge difference. And that, you know, that, that feeling of being valued doesn't just come from you running, you know, it's what you can give other people as well. And I think that would be my number one tip. If you can't run, get out there and volunteer when you can, when you can, even if it's just a local park run, you'll come away with those same kind of endorphins that you will get from running. Maybe not quite as good, but still good. <laughs> you know, get out there, shout, and you'll feel better for it. The second thing is I'd say, concentrate on the things you can't control. Um, with injury, you, there's so many elements that you can't control with that. So you've got to focus on the things you can control. So when I had my, uh, I've had my knee, uh, knee injury, I, can't, I couldn't run at all for six weeks, couldn't even go on the bike for six weeks. So I just focused on abs of steel, basically for that time so you know i could take superman with these abs right now but you know focus on the things you can control so for me that was abs and um you know upper body upper body type stuff to help with my pole work to give me that um sort of longer term um strength and conditioning for later in the race so concentrate on the things you can control number two and the third thing i just say is um you know, we running doesn't define us as people. So it, running is a great, it's a massive part of who I am. I'd be absolutely devastated if I couldn't, if I could never run again. But it doesn't define me, you know, in terms of who I am. Have other things that define you, you know. I have a crisp obsession. That's another thing that defines me. There's I have my kids, you know, family. Um, I also, you know, like to read lots of books. I massively recommend getting into book reading, you know, your top top book that books that change your life and um, so have other things make conscious effort to not make running your be all and end all and if you could never run again remember you can always go and you can support a race so you know the social media stuff that's never the whole picture it's never the whole picture in everyone's life everyone has got stuff in their closet things that aren't going well you never see the whole picture on social media. But I think where we can, what's also helped me is to elevate other people. When you elevate other people, you elevate yourself. So those are my top three takeaways. You'd be great on like a good morning show. Yeah. This, this could be <laughs> You're ready. I feel show. ready for the day. Oh, yeah, let's go, 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 go. Let's go, go, go. <laughs> Not today. Not today. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Eddie. <laughs> uh, I really like um, what Chris was saying. Yeah, I mean, the the sad um, fact of the matter is raven um this is probably not going to be your only setback in your running career so if you can start to implement things now so that the next time this comes up you're like oh i've been through this before i've done this before and and i got through it and i'll get through the next one so 
it is the positivity and it's such a pain in the butt because you're not feeling like being positive. But if you do something like Trish says to just get out of the house or like Eddie said, all the athletes that I've seen, I've been around some exceptional athletes, they all get setbacks. And it's the positive ones that make it in, in running. It's always the positive ones who bounce back quicker. The negative guys who feel sorry for themselves and get all down in the dumps just seems to take longer. The body follows the mind. So if you can just force yourself to do the things like Trish said, reading a book or I like to play guitar or you, you will have other interests and you can go cultivate those and then come back here yeah, big and stronger with the rock solid abs or, or whatever else it is. I love all that. Hopefully there's something you can take away there, Raven, that'll help you on your journey. Good luck, Raven. We love, love you, Raven. Raven. We love woo, you, woo. Raven. Yeah, hopefully that helped. And like Eddie said before, it's not just an answer for Raven. Anyone can take that. And I've had a few DMs, actually. They really love in the format of the new podcast and highlighted Brew with the Coaches, too. So did we last week give a shout out to Trish? I don't think we did because she did so amazing at the arc of attrition. And I don't think we gave her a personal shout out. Uh, Thanks, she... Trish. She, I mean, all those brew with the coaches, she was sandbagging. My knee's a bit sore. I haven't been able to do my training, but I'm just going to smash this one out. Goes to show, goes to show, don't need a big volume, just focus on what you can do. And obviously those abs of steel help Trish uh, finish an incredible arc of attrition. We were super proud of you. We're super proud to call you a friend, but also one of our coaches on the Tea and Trails podcast. Talking about arc of attrition, Eddie, that was... Uh... Seamless link. It's number 62 <laughs> in Spreads Global uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, this week we speak with uh, Robin Cassidy. Now, Robin is an athlete worth keeping an eye on. And I have to admit, you know, maybe being from the north, uh, I didn't really know much about Robin, but Robin was second female uh, at the 100-mile event with a time well under 24 hours. And, uh, yeah, she was only uh, beat by Emma Stewart, and we all know how small and fast Emma Stewart is. So, yeah, it was great to catch up with Robin, to hear her story and find out about future plans too. I hope you enjoy our chat with Robin Cassidy. Hi, Robin. Thank you so much for giving us giving up your lunch break for us today. We feel very privileged. Fresh off your second place at Arc of Attrition. How are you feeling? How is the recovery going? Because it's, what are we, 10 days? Eight days? Eight, eight to 10. I don't know. It's still a bit we'll give it some context. Yeah. How are you feeling? Yeah. yeah, no, I'm starting to feel a bit more normal now. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the first couple of days, um, I was getting a lot of help going up and down the stairs. Um, but that started to feel a little bit better towards the end of last week. So um, I've been out on a couple of runs, um, testing, the, testing the legs. I mean, ploddy, ploddy, ploddy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, starting to feel a bit more normal now. Was it your first 100 miler? Yeah, yeah. Was it everything you thought it would be? That just yeah. <laughs> just for the over enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah, no, it was. Um, I mean, I kind of went into it really nervous, and um, I mean, there's a huge amount of unknowns. It, probably even if you've done hundred milers before. Oh yeah, they're never a given. They're always a fresh fresh batch of problems <laughs> yeah there's still so many kind of unknowns and kind of what ifs that were kind of looming so the week before yeah I was pretty pretty nervous but um no it was just an amazing experience like the whole the whole weekend like my family coming down my family crewing the the race itself was unreal and then just everything that's happened afterwards has just been really lovely we're going to jump more into the race uh, in a little bit. In a little bit, but can we first rewind? Let's see how yeah. you got to uh, that incredible performance at the Arc. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, maybe as a person and and as a runner as well? We ser- we were just saying to you, weren't we, that we we trolled you on social media a lot. But <laughs> um, so I can see lots of exciting. You've done lots of exciting things that aren't necessarily trail races as well. Uh, yeah. Can you share with uh, our listeners a little bit about your story so far. Yeah, sure. Um, so, well, in terms of running, um, I've I've kind of always ran since like since a kid. It's pretty it's pretty ingrained in me. Um, so it it started with actually my mum was on a bit of a health kick, and when I was about eleven or twelve, she 
had this run. It was two miles. It was a mile out from the farm where I grew up and then a mile back. And she used to drag me out of bed in the morning before school. Um, and so I love us, Mummy Cassidy. I love it. Yeah, blame her. Um, and then I, I kind of did cross country and athletics at school. Um, so I did a little bit there. And then kind of during my 20s and like uni time, um, I wasn't really that competitive with it, but it was just something that I used to go running with friends, go explore a new area. You would get the maps out and see what's around and then go go explore. Um, I dabbled in a little bit of triathlon, but um, turns out I'm not very good on the bike. <laughs> I mean, I love my bikes, but I'm not fast. Normally um, people say they swim, don't they? That's their weakness. Yeah, no, I, I like my swimming because I did a bit of um, did a bit of swim run, actually. Um, so there's Ortillo, which is kind of a more of a global brand, but there's Mad Hatters down in Cornwall. Um, and there's some great, great, um, great events. They're proper little adventures. Um, That's when you run in your, like, wetsuit, isn't it? And you have, like, yeah. special shoes and you... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you don't look. It's not a cool looking sport. I can guarantee that. Um, but you have. But you, like, you have to. Yeah, and you have to run quite far, don't you? Like five k. Like yeah, yeah. So the um, so yeah, you have kind of it's like a running wetsuit, zips up at the front, like it's a little bit more pliable around the legs. Um, and then you have your trainers on, and then you've got a little swim boy that's attached to your leg. You run, and then when you get in the water, you flip the swim boy round, and then you just use your arms, and then you have paddles as well. So there's a lot of kit. So there's a race called Attilo, and that runs, there's one in the Ozzacilli, and then it runs in Sweden as well. Um, so me and a friend, because you do it in a little team. It is, yeah. Yeah. You so tied friend, together, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and you have like a little team name. So our team name was um, Butch Cassidy and the Stumpy Boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> that was inspired. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, you run as a little team. Um, but yeah, the running, um, so the Attilo one, it was 60k of running in total and then 10k of swimming, oh, but it's all okay. divided up into like manageable <clears throat> chunks. Okay. okay. Manageable. Manageable. Yeah. <laughs> but you, like, you can't finish one of those events without like a million stories to tell people. So. Oh, especially when you've done it with someone as well, the hilarity yeah, yeah. Like, and some weak moments as well, where the cord gets stretched. <laughs> oh my there's there's just so there's so many silly things that happen during that event because like it is a like it's a fun sport but it's 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 a balmy sport so yeah um, yeah so anyway I did a bit of swim run and then that kind of led me to up distances um and it was just more I was just getting really inquisitive so I don't know you do a few marathons and then you're like oh what's this 50k about um so we um me and a few friends did a couple of 50ks and then last year I did 100K um, and then it was kind of off the back of that that I just wanted to learn more about the, the bigger distances. And was it a road to trail journey? That's quite often with our guests. Um, they may have just done a local 10K and then all of a sudden they discovered the trails or were you straight on the trails? Um, I've always enjoyed the trails more. Um, I've done run events and I do enjoy them, but I just don't get the same buzz as yeah. you do when you're on the trails um there's just something different about it and um I think it's that opportunity of getting like properly outdoors into the hills as well um you just don't get that on the road um but it was probably the thing that really spun it for me is I I volunteered at Dragon's Back last year oh, so wow. I'm a physio so I was in the med team and um so I'd kind of dip my toe in the ultra world and I got to Dragon's Back and you, you just get to talking to all the volunteers and everybody is like, everyone's done like three or 400 milers, yeah. the Bob Graham round, the Ramsey round. And like, they're just some incredible people, but totally down to earth and really, really friendly. And I don't know, I was talking to all of them and I was just like, I want in on this world. I want yeah, a piece of me this. In. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it starts. Tell us a little bit, apart from when you're doing these crazy things, what do, what you mentioned you're a physio. What does your normal life look like at the moment? So, um, yeah, I'm a physio. So um, I work in a military rehab centre. So I'm not in the military, but I work for the military. Um, so I've been is that down that. at Headley Court? Is that it? So I was at Headley Court, yeah. Yeah. But... Um, that site it closed down because it got 
the whole site moved up to Stafford mm. Hall. Went up to Birmingham, the... didn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So it's in the Midlands now. So I moved up with them. So I've been doing that for the last like seven, eight years, I think. Um, mm. So I was working clinically. Um, and then it was in the last couple of years that I've, or during that COVID period, I made a transition across, but I've moved into more research now. So I now work in the research department at Stamford Hall. Um, and uh, yeah, so just working on a few projects with that, started my PhD with work. Um, so it's enough to keep me busy. Yeah, is, it, is it quite compliment running as in now you're in the clinical side? Is it a slightly less physical? And so you have a little bit more energy to train or is that not? I actually found it quite hard when I switched over because um, with the research work, it's a lot more desk based now and it's yeah. a lot more kind of admin heavy where um, with physio, it's not it's not physical, but you're up on your feet, you're in the gym, you're, yeah. you're kind of yeah. moving around with clients. And I just noticed that, especially with training, going from training to sitting to training to sitting was actually a lot harder than um, just that kind of like gentle movement throughout the day. Mm, mm, mm. You mentioned that you have a lunch break. Do you try and go and train during then or do you just leave it? I'm an early morning gal. Um, but I'm also we're, we're we're lucky we get gyms on site. Of um, course, yeah. Oh, I love that. We do have a little track as well. Um, oh, goodness so. me. I know. <laughs> that would be awesome. It's Gary's Danger. dream would be out. Just 15 more minutes. Get this yeah. threshold run down. I'll be back to <laughs> yeah, Never get anything so, done. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's really lovely, actually, because during lunch, so um, there's a real kind of, um, I don't know, training culture. So at lunchtime, everyone's kind of in, well, not everyone, but a lot of people are in the gym and out going for runs and things like that. And so it makes it part of a social part of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's not too easy to get away from the computer. I love that the social culture. I imagine if you work in a sports shop too, it'd be such a good positive culture to be around. Yeah, I like the idea of that. Yeah. Can you rewind a little bit because obviously yeah. we both got dragons back. Uh, you're in the physio tent. What was that like? Is it Don't carnage? Tell is the... <laughs> Don't tell him, get Robin. <laughs> um, it was the week was an amazing experience, yeah. and I like I definitely say to anyone if you're kind of thinking about Dragons Back, like, and you're not sure, like, volunteering is a really good way to kind of get a real insight of what happens over the week. Um, the the med team were amazing. They're like led by um, a consultant, and then we've got we had about three three docs on the team, three nurses, and wow. then we had three physios. So it's a big team, and um, we're busy. <laughs> it gets very busy. Um, so we kind of worked in shift patterns, and um, but the med tent opened at five in the morning pre-race um i mean they encourage people to manage their own feet during the race but sometimes when it just could kind of teet teet over that edge and they just need a little bit more support um the nurses you can't when they that. can't bend to do their feet because yeah, i was, this, pretty this, much when, when we got all the deets like we had to take a load more stuff on the spine like we had to take needles and stuff and tape yeah. which they haven't had to take before because they're like you know you need to give this to the medic or you need to do your own feet and i i was like seriously like after you know so many days i'm not going to reach my feet to actually <laughs> then put this tape on or carefully yeah. syringe blisters i was like i can't see being able to do this after 200 miles yeah but yeah yeah, of course, medics are always so kind. They always take care of poor, tortured souls. I mean, I, I loved it in terms of, um, in ter like, this sounds really weird, but in terms of the foot care, um, it was I found it so interesting. Oh, so interesting. Yeah, so, so, like, they would be, like, managing some of the feet, and I'd be, like, sitting there, like, trying to get my head in, like, oh, what's going on there? So that bit of tape there, so you, exactly, you're placing that, okay, can you do it again, just so I can... Yeah. <laughs> can you just replicate that? Yeah, some good case studies, wow. yeah. Cool. Okay, we'll get on to the arc petition. I always like asking our guests this. What why that race? What why this race for you? What was it about the arc that drew you to it? After the 100k, definitely that hundred mile I was just like kind of stuck in the head. And I couldn't I couldn't get out. Um, it was race to the stones you did as your hundred K, yes. wasn't it? Just yeah. so very different yeah. to the arc. So different. So different. Yeah, race to the stones was amazing. Um it was a, it, like a really nice introduction to those distances. Perfect, yeah. I didn't have 
like I had a good race, but I, I had COVID the kind of the week, 10 days before. So I wasn't a hundred percent, um, but still, regardless of that, still enjoyed it, had a great time, still did it. So I was pleased. Um, but yeah, hundred mile, I kind of just, uh, it just got in and it wouldn't leave. Um, so I started looking at all the ones in the UK and, um, Arc of Attrition is, well, it's just beautiful trails. And I found that I just kept on going back to that website. And then I was like going on YouTube. I was looking at all the like videos and the race reports. And like, it just turned into this little like obsession of just, I just wouldn't, couldn't leave it alone. Um, and it was That's actually, me. Eddie, it was something that you said. Like, oh no, like, don't put this on me, no, Robin. No, no, Do no. Not. <laughs> I'm blaming you. <laughs> um, I think you said ages ago, um, like pick a race that like inspires you, but like scares you a little bit. And I just found that like it was scary, but also just that, like that inspiration. I just couldn't like get away from it. So. And it's when it keeps coming up on like when you go to check, go on Google and it keeps coming up as recent history. You're like, I think yeah. I need to listen to this. Yeah. I keep... Are you from that area of the of the country? Yeah. So grew up, grew up in Somerset um, on a farm. And um, then, so yeah, I've got a love of the Southwest, definitely. Um, we went down to like Cornwall and Devon and stuff for holidays and things like that. So it's got good memories attached to it. And um, and it also meant that being in that area that my family could come as well. And they were my, they were my crew. Um, they knew that the, they t- the A303 and the A30 well, they were happy. Yeah, yeah, I probably know the A3 as well. It's interesting. I didn't realize that. So you can, because I know Lakeland 100, you're not allowed any crew whatsoever. This is a different format for the arc. You could have your own crew. Yeah, yeah. Fun. And it seems yeah. like the majority of the runners have crews. I think some do without, and they can have a drop bag at Land's End. Yeah. Um, I mean, kudos to them because yeah. that is a tough race to do without a crew. I like, mean, and and also, Gary, you you can have crew a lot. So it's not like, you know, if sometimes you look at races and you're like, I can see my crew at 20 miles and then again at 60. You know, there's not that much advantage in that. Yeah. But arc of attrition, if you want to in your crew... <laughs> can do it <laughs> you, you can see them a ton can't you so there is it is a massive benefit if you've is got it a crew. chaos though in some little fishing cove and there's just all these vw camper vans we need robin's what? family <laughs> yeah. i mean they worked hard <laughs> they worked super hard um so i had my uh my mum and my stepdad who did day shift one um so they covered um from the start to penzance and then my sister and my brother-in-law took over and they did night shift, bless them. Um, it was actually, younger. They loved it, I'm sure. Yeah, but it was actually their first year anniversary as well, their <laughs> wedding. Robin. I know, which I was... What a treat. I know. I bet, I bet they had some romantic moments in the sand. Too. <laughs> yeah. Pot noodle. Pot noodle, yeah. <laughs> in my leftover pot noodles. Torch, torch lit pot noodle. <laughs> Perfect. So Perfect. anyway, they they did the night shift, and then my folks took over from Lands uh, from St Ives to the finish, which was quite a nice way to do it because then it meant well they could have had sleep. I don't think they slept, but they could have had sleep if they wanted to. But I, there's no way I could have done it without them. Absolutely no chance. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And what's the course details? And I'm being a northerner, I know nothing. I know roughly where it is. You know the geography of the course. Being but, a uh, northerner, that's no excuse, Gary. You see it as if you can't get there. Well, I just saw. I don't know. I'm so blinkered by the moors in the Lake District. I don't see much. <laughs> but yeah, if someone from North fancies this race, what would they expect? It's a really challenging route. It's super, super challenging. It's different compared to um, lakes and uh, Snowdon, where obviously you've got like long, big ascents and then like long descents. It's um, it's different in the fact that they're like the elevation for the total race. I think it it tipped over five thousand meters on my watch. So there's a lot of elevation over that time, but it's yeah. a lot of short, sharp. Ascent, descent, ascent, descent, as you're going kind of into the little bays and then back out again. Um, at the start, there's a bit, there's a bit of a cheeky bit at the start of the race. Um, so you start off from Coverack and then from there down to Lizard, which is the first 10 miles of the race. 
um, it's actually it's a pretty hard section. Um, there's a lot of this, um, there's a lot of little climbs, um, and it makes it quite hard to get into your rhythm of running. And I remember when I was I was wrecking it, and that was the first bit that I wrecked. And um, I just remember like running the first five miles, being like, Ooh, "How am I going to do this?" <laughs> um, so yeah, they definitely um, they definitely make the first bit interesting. And then you get down to Lizard Point, which is the most southerly point, maybe. Um, and then um, from there, you go up to Mullion Cove, which is beautiful. It kind of stretches out. You get long, more like runnable sections. And that's the thing with the art. There's a lot of big runnable sections and the views are um, just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, so you run up to Mullion and then you get to your first checkpoint at Port Leven, which is, I think it's about 25 miles. Um, and then from there, um, you go from Porth Levin to Penzance, which is your second checkpoint. And there's actually a big road section in that. So um, again, it's just the constantly changing terrain. You've got like these ups and downs, and then you've got these big runnable like trail bits, and then you've got a road section. So there's like loads of different elements to think about. Um, and there was like a real question actually, when I was like looking at all the podcasts and things before the race, um, of like, do, pe do people change their shoes mm, yeah. for the road section? And um, so there's that big question of whether you do or you don't. Um, so yeah, yeah. Then you get to the second checkpoint at Penzance. Um, that is, I can't remember. It's about forty miles. It's not halfway. It's about forty miles. And then you're heading into the night at that point. I think I got there about eight nine o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's when I said goodbye to my folks and hello to my brother and um, brother-in-law and my sister. Night shift. Yeah, they love, both took the over. Lovebirds, as we'll call them. <laughs> yeah, the lovebirds. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Did you change your shoes? For the road section. No, oh. no, I didn't. Because I, I saw didn't. that Holly did change her shoes. I bet Emma didn't. Emma would be like, I don't own road shoes. Well, I'd, I'd road <laughs> shoes. Not. <laughs> I'd be too stressed, like stop and waste a minute. So how long is yeah. the road section then? I don't it was know. 10 miles of road section. Oh, I'd swap them shoes instantly. <laughs> <laughs> carbon plate. Just... No, yeah, yeah, I think Holly I... put on a pair of carbon, uh, a little carbon swifty pair. <laughs> yeah there's there's so many elements to think about i think the idea of changing my shoes as well i was just like that's just another thing um mm. so and then they like, might oh, rub that's... if your feet have like swollen that would be yeah. my worry like if you're super comfy just don't just I, I put the music on for that section i'd just be like let's get some s club seven and taylor swift on and just you know, <laughs> party <this." laughs> and it's actually it, it comes it's a bit of a welcome relief because you get again it's that constant changing trail so you're shifting your body about so actually when you get to the road you kind of welcome the road but when there's your brain dark, as well your brain can just be like switch off just switch off and get this running this head torch yeah and then when the road section finishes you're kind of welcoming the trail again you're like bring me back the trail yeah. <laughs> um and then fr well from penzance so you've got penzance to L land's end and then that's the next section where land's end is where you've got your next big checkpoint so that section covers like lamorna and minac and it gets a lot more kind of technical at that point um so it's a lot like your pace just drops and you'll find like they found with all the runners kind of you get to penzance and then everyone's pace just slows down because you're like stumbling around over these rocks <laughs> and things like that um and that's that the middle was, that is that the last like, like you got to that bit at like the middle of the night as well when yeah yeah you get to that point i think i got to land's end around oh i'll have to check my time probably just after midnight maybe mm -hmm. so you're going into the night at that point and um yeah it does get a lot more technical um at that point you're still well relatively fresh for like more technical trail so up to lens land's end you can kind of keep pushing with it um and then oh i had this had this moment with my crew where well my sister and my brother-in-law um where i met them at oh i'm not going to pronounce this right porth gara you don't need to worry about any pronunciation okay. because we All right. we, Before land's end. we obliterate <laughs> everyone's names and places every week i'm going to obliterate one soon <laughs> yeah i met them before land's end and um they'd kind of walked from the car to meet me and um so we're like checking changing things over and then i just asked them i was like oh have you got any socks because i'd love to change my socks over 
Um, and they didn't, which was absolutely fine. And we kind of were like, right, I'm seeing you next at Cape Cornwall, which is another, I think it's about 15 miles. Um, I was like, I'll, I'll meet you in Cape Cornwall. Well, I'll meet you in Cape Cornwall and then we'll change, I'll do a little change of socks there. And so I left and carried on running and kind of mentally was just like, don't worry about it. It's fine. You don't need new socks. Um, and then just after Land's End, um, there's a place called Senan, and actually they just rerouted and they're like, right, she needs socks. So they came in early. Um, and so it was about five, 10 miles later, I met them and complete surprise. I was running through Senan and I saw their little van and they were standing there with a little pair of socks and oh my God, it was the, it was the oh. best feeling ever. A try. surprise a surprise pop-up and a pair yeah. of fresh socks and um, with fresh socks um so yeah i'll be eternally grateful for those like one in the morning fresh pair of socks that they delivered so then you're at land's end i guess yes we passed yeah we're at land's so, end, and you, you make a right you start turning back yeah so then you go onto the kind of north part of the mm. coast so um from land's end to you go to through Senan, cape cornwall Pendine and then St Ives and then St Ives is the next official checkpoint and then that section is is known as like the crux of the route it's um it's technical you're in the middle of the night you can't get as much support from your crew um you're kind of in the latter stage of the night as well so um yeah the kind of three four in the morning you're in your head torch bubble and um yeah it's just it's um it's a lot of boulders to scramble over. And I just, it felt like I was almost on this um, five minute real repeat that just was endless and just would not like not stop. Um, so yeah, you feel like you're stuck on repeat for a good few hours. Someone described it to me as boulder purgatory. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's quite a bit. Yeah. They, it was dry then. Yeah, the conditions were really, really good um so that and um, i mean that helps yeah, yeah you don't no one wants the boulders yeah and probably one of the reasons why there's such good course times this year as well is just that course was in good nick for that time of year so yeah so went through that section and then got to st ives i had so actually just before st ives had a bit of a strange um experience strange experience um in the fact that as i was coming into st ives it was me at that time and another runner who were kind of paired off for that little last section and we just saw the lights of st ives and so kind of get excited about that and we're running down this little hill and we ended up hearing kind of shouts coming from um coming from like the brambles um to the right of us and um basically and we saw this little head torch so we kind of slowed down and we tried to work out what he um, what was happening um and it turned out that it was a it was a runner that was stuck in the brambles and he oh, wow. yeah yeah and he rang the race, race hq who then um who then actually contacted me so as i was running my phone started ringing yeah. um so i was so confused and you're so kind of spaced and like you don't know what's going on but my phone started ringing so i answered it and it was the race race hq and they could basically see that my tracker was passing him and he'd rang for help um so they were asking if um me and the other runner could um could kind of get to him so we ended up stopping probably for about just under 10 minutes and we were just basically shouting to this guy who got caught in these brambles and um seeing if he could like move forwards or move to the side or um like get out um we didn't have i didn't have my race poles at the moment and well, there was no way i was going to reach him um but we were trying to maneuver it like guide him out but he he was wedged oh properly, properly wedged so they ended up actually calling um the the tea um i think they called the med team out and they got him out yeah um, and i found out at the end that he finished as well um which is amazing um, so had he fallen into the so you know, he got i think he just lost track yeah of, so easy in the, the dark yeah. and then tried to cut back onto the track and, but it was this real thicket of brambles and they were like higher than me um and there was no way that we were getting close to him um so but i can imagine that's a 
little bit scary. Really You're scary. So stressed out with that. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bramble so... Guy. If you anyone knows Bramble Guy, Bramble send him our way. We'll find him. Check he's all right. Yeah. All those yeah. little puts. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, but that was just such a surreal experience because, like, halfway through, I was like, "Is this happening, or am yeah, I? Yeah. <laughs> what is going on?" <laughs> um. But yeah, so after after that, I got pretty cold at that point because mm-hmm. we'd stopped for a bit. So I got to St. Ives um, and that was when my folks took over. So they'd like started their second shift of covering for crew and bless them because they left me in Penzance where I was like all perky and happy. And then they saw me at St. Ives and I was, because I'd stopped for 10 minutes, I arrived in St. Ives and I was this like shivering wreck and um i was really hungry at the time and they were just like who is this <sighs> person like <laughs> who's just i don't know arrived in front of us um i don't think i looked that fresh <laughs> i'm never so keen for family my wife and children to see me at, at races just in case for that um i don't want them to see dad in a mess <laughs> oh i love it i make sure that they are there <laughs> I'm like, you can watch this <laughs> yeah uh but you you got yourself back together M- yeah i got myself um, supplied um, with pot noodles yeah so got supplied with lots of treat uh chocolate peanuts at that point i don't think i've ever eaten so many chocolate peanuts mm. like i was literally at handfuls of them shoving them in my face like like they opened the box of um food that they had and i just like delved into it like this little like feral animal um <laughs> so <laughs> yeah ate a lot of food then um had a bit of a low moment coming out of St Ives because I'm not sure if you guys have experienced or Eddie if you experienced this um when it, it was getting light at that time and um so it was like going from dust to light and I turned my head torch off and I don't know whether the yeah I always ke- I always ke- keep mine on until yeah. it's really light because the eyes are tired and you don't want to put any extra effort in having to read the trail or um so I yeah, people other people would turn their head torches off and I'd be like, Nope, mine is not going off until I can see the different like the blades of grass or like really see the trail really well. Cause I think you're so tired, aren't you? But yeah. You, on a normal run, you wouldn't even wear a head torch, you'd be like, This is lovely. But <laughs> when you're I think, I think that's a good tip, and I think that's where I went wrong because I turned my head torch off and yeah, my my eyes were pretty tired and I got super, super dizzy mm-hmm. um, to the point where I was like veering around the road mm-hmm. coming off the St. Ives and I had to like hold on to the side of the wall for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it, it passed as soon as it got light, but um, yeah, that wasn't wasn't uh, like the best moment of coming out of St. Ives. <laughs> Is that at about 83 bit further St Ives St Ives is so St Ives is the point where again um when you're reading about it it's like get to St Ives and you know and you're gonna finish and you're, you're gonna, gonna finish. finish um you I mean you've still got just under 20 miles to go but like um, Champak Slack as a UTMB they're like if you get out of Champak Slack you're gonna finish and you're like oh. there's still such a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's still a while so you come out St Ives and then you've got um you go into Hale um, so you've got a little, another little road section, um, and then you go into what they call the Dunes of Doom, which is a nice name. Um, and so you go through the Dunes of Doom. Actually, I quite enjoyed that section. I was a bit nervous beforehand about just getting lost in these dunes, but um, there's these big rock kind of placard things that kind of signpost you all the way through it, um, where the southwest coast path goes through. So managed like managed to get through that okay and actually I felt like that was a little win that I managed to get through without getting lost so that felt like a little high um and then you go from um from there back up onto the um back up onto like the cliffs basically from Godrivi and then it's from Godrivi to Portree and then into Porth Town where the finish is so you've got this lovely like flat section for a little bit and you feel like you can kind of settle into that and you feel like the race is done until you get to poor tree. I think I've said that right. Yeah. And, um, and then there's these set of hills and there's about four, four or five of them 
where and I hadn't recorded this bit. I knew they were there, but I hadn't mm-hmm. recorded them. And they are, oh, they're really cheeky for the end. Um, yeah, that was a grit my teeth and just poor legs. Like, yeah, grit my was teeth the, and go. Was the up worse or the down worse? Down, no, down. Sure. I think at that point I was talking to myself out loud, being like, come yeah. on, Robin. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. Was that an infamous part of the course? I know Lakeland 100, they talk about Jacob's Ladder at the end. Were you aware this was coming? Yeah, they do talk about the little, um, those hills at the end. Well, they're not little, those hills at the end. Um, and they're just, they're, they're short, but they're very steep. And um, they're steps as well. And the steps are quite deep. So whereas if it was a hill where you could just run up, like what well, walk or run up the trail, um, that would be a little bit easier. But because there's steps, um, that yeah, it takes its toll on the legs, definitely. For sure. And you might have done a few miles before. Probably if you ran it on a normal day, you'd be like trot, trot, trot. Yeah. <laughs> a few miles in your legs. Yeah. Um, and then you go into Porth Tower and then oh, um so you get to Porth Tower and then the, the archangels, which are the the volunteers on the course, who were amazing throughout the course. Um so they meet you as you come into Porth Tower and they basically there's like one every kind of 50, 100 meters, and you run with one and then they drop you off the next one, you run with the next one, and they drop you off. And you get kind of like ran into like the finish. And then obviously there's another hill at the finish. So they drop you off at the bottom of the hill and then it's this big incline up to the finish line. Um, but by that point, there's nothing stopping you. Like you're yeah. like the end's in sight. Um, and I remember my my brother-in-law was standing at the bottom of the hill and my stepdad was at the top. Um, and so that was lovely to see them. I think um, Kyle, my brother-in-law, tried to start a conversation up and I was like, nope, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what was it like at the end? We often talk about these big, big days out on the trails when you're you're alone for you know pretty much a day, and then you get to the finish. Were you, was it just a bit of an overload for you? Yeah, it was just overwhelming. Um, I think I was in a bit of a daze, and also what I'm not used to because I haven't done these types of races before is that they um, you cross the finish line, you you get a hug from the race director. Oh, oh, she's so lovely. <laughs> Um, so you get this like, lovely hug um, and then they take a few photos, but then you go straight to get an interview, um, which was um, like really short. And it's okay. like, it's really good that they're covering it um, and like showing that. But I'm like, I, I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> but that's the beauty of them, isn't it? They're supposed yeah. like no one expects you to say, so world peace, let's discuss that and how I'm <laughs> yeah. going to go about it. Uh... Some people are really coherent. I'm surprised they can. Yeah. I think I think you need to. I think I just have a few cards. Get this. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, can I just ask one thing about the race, Gary, and then we'll jump back to the sort of training question. So how, you finished in second place and you were pretty much in second place right from the beginning how, how did that play out was that did you feel like that was pressure or did you just forget about that were you aware of behind you how did you handle yeah. that um so uh, probably not very well for the first section mm-hmm. um so we start um, when we started obviously there's a big group of you and then it starts to spread out after eight ten miles and um I was very conscious because everyone says first hundred mile, don't go off too fast. Don't go off too fast. Yeah. But this is different, isn't it? Cause yeah. if it had been me, I'd been, you've got to get ahead in that first 10 miles because people are going to start fast, but then not be any good on that terrain and you're going to be held up. So I'd be like, blow it in the first 10 miles. And then hold <laughs> <Sorry. off. laughs> all your matches. <laughs> um, but I think that was what the top girls did. They went really hard that first 10 miles and you got ahead and the other girls got a little bit held up and then they never could close the gap. And then they never caught yeah. Back up. Yeah. yeah. So um I kind of I did push a little bit through Kovarak, the um the village, just because I knew it bunched up after Kovarak. Mm. So I didn't want to get caught in the bunch. But then as the, like the group spread out, um I was like I was constantly checking my pace. Um because I just didn't, I wasn't expecting to be in that position in the field. And then when I was, I just like, I just felt like massive imposter syndrome, to be honest. And um, 
And so I was just like, I shouldn't be here. I must be going off too fast. But I was just checking my pace. It was sitting where it should be um, that sat normally within my training. Um, so um, I was trying to reassure myself with that. Um, I remember I went through um, Lizard and there's quite a crowd at Lizard the, um, because people can't go to the start line. So um, so there's, there's quite a few people at Lizard. And I remember running through Lizard and just being like, can no one notice me, please? Like, I just yeah. Didn't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, then everyone's shouting, you second woman. Yeah. Like, yeah, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know. <laughs> like um yeah and then um so I carried on running and um then I just kept on my pace but then kind of just before or just I know it's just after the first checkpoint I was actually running with Holly for a bit and we were chatting and I kind of mentioned I was like oh I don't feel like I feel like I shouldn't be here like not feeling that great about it and she was she was really good actually. She was just like, just run your own race, do your own thing, don't worry about anything else. Um, and so that gave me a little bit of reassurance. And then chatting to my crew as well. Um, they like, I don't know, they just they were like, um, my stepdad was just like, Robin, you know you're running, like don't just like reassure yourself, you know what you're doing, just keep going. Um and then once kind of things, once I got a bit further in the race and I felt that I wasn't blowing up and all of that sort of stuff, I kind of calmed down a bit. But yeah, that first bit was, a, um, yeah. <laughs> you, said, oh, you, you know, you're happy with your peers. Did you have a heart rate monitor to kind of back that up to so you knew your effort? No, I don't tend to look at heart rate too much. Um, I tend to lean more on my effort levels. Um, so like I can well one I've so I've got the wrist heart rate okay. monitor yeah and they're not so good are they yeah they're not as good and I don't like maybe I just don't wear my watch very well um but it doesn't seem to read accurately accurately to how I feel yeah um I'm sure it's better if you've got the chest strap but um I've just learned to run to feeling um so that's what I kind of lean on one last for me before we will go to uh, a couple of training questions but yeah any tips for people who maybe think about touring the line in 2024 with i would say oh there's loads of information online um so definitely like one thing that's really good is that they um there's loads of like race reports um there's loads of uh like root routes um videos that show you different parts of the um different parts of the route so like get get a look at those um they come out with a really good race manual um, and information for crew as well. Um, and that was super helpful. They come out with this little like time spreadsheet. So you can kind of judge where you are on the course and that helps with timings. Um, I I would definitely say if you can get down and recce it. Um, well, from a not, yeah, from my point of view, that's a big journey. Yeah. Nav wise, would I be okay without a recce, do you think? I mean, keep the C on your left. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah um it's it it's doable yeah no you can definitely do it off your watch especially now watches are so watches good. are so good aren't they yeah i think, I think it's worth reassuring people because i think like five years ago the watches weren't as good and they'd be late to load and you'd suddenly would yeah. suddenly say you're off course and then it wouldn't but i think gps's now are so good and also now you can get really good handheld gps's as well yeah. so if you're in it for the experience over the actual like competent you know you're not thinking i'm going to be podiuming i want to do the race and a handheld is just as good but i think i think yeah there'd probably be little turns aren't they that if you've wrecked you'd be like ah oh, yeah this bit's a bit tricky you know mm. left but then that's the beat you know you slow down and you just check you're still on that line on your watch and just take a little bit more time so probably if you're in it for the experience the adventure yeah and also you can wreck it but actually 14, 15 dark. hours later, it's in the dark anyway. That's the same I had about the span. I was like, okay, I don't know 200 miles of this, but it's in the dark anyway. And then the bits I did know were in the dark anyway, so I didn't know where I was. So actually yeah. it was my, my the line on my watch was the only bits <laughs> of any use. Yeah. <laughs> well, Anthony, we've got a question from our Patreon members. Uh, Peter Krautfilfer, hopefully I've kind of pronounced that right, Peter. Uh and yeah, he's curious to know how to train for such a race if you are living in an area without similar mountains or hills. So yeah, I suppose which key sessions 
did you do building up to the arc? My training plan, I I kind of based it off. I did a load of reading beforehand. Um, like there's some really good ultra running books out there from coaches, which I found really beneficial. Um, and then I kind of created a training plan from that. And then I got it reviewed by a coach who lives near in the peaks, um, just to give me a bit of reassurance that I was kind of on the right type, like in terms of volume and in terms of like my quality sessions during the week. Um, and then I kind of stuck, stuck to that. Um, in terms of hills, um, I, well, I use the Peak District um, to to train for hills, and actually that replicated Cornwall quite well because you could you could create these short sharp descents, in a sense um, that um, that kind of were similar to the course. But if you don't have access to that, um, I mean, you can replicate things on treadmills. You can use steppers as well. Strength training um, is something that I'm really um, I, I, I just try not to negate my strength training. Um, so, I mean, you can do it at home, you can do it in the gym, um, but something that works on just building up that, um, that load on your quads, because your quads get, um, yeah, Mutilated. they get I suppose especially, yeah, if you need to get your elevation on the treadmill, you're not going to smash them up going down, are you? So, yeah, if mm. you can strengthen them in the gym. Yeah, but even if you can find, like, just a short hill, because... The hills themselves in Cornwall, they um they're they're short and steep. So you don't need you don't need mountains, you just need one short hill and then doing your, your hill sessions on that um would would be enough, even if you can just find one. I had quite a few clients, yeah, doing arc of attrition, all with different hill needs. Yeah. Um, and so we did a session um called Kenyan Hills session where you where they just have one hill and it it you want it as relatively steep but whatever hill you have and then you you can adapt it to according to your fitness and you can repeat it many times and build on it really well so you choose mm. start off you might even start with like two minutes and you go up and down it needs about 40 seconds long up and down for two minutes it's hard you go hard and then you you rest at the bottom with a little walk uh standing rest and then you repeat you know three or four times and then you build into that and that's a great way to bust the quads and it can be done in quite relatively you can smash those quads in 20 minutes so if you're not if you've got like one hill or you've perhaps got like people can do it in like multi-story car park you can like any sort of like little ramp um you can do a session like that up and down just you just need a little bit of imagination um yeah to get that yeah because i'd have thought the descending is the biggest thing um with all these hilly mountain races the getting up finding stuff the ways to train of going up is quite easy especially if you've got access to a gym it's the downward the down um uh, the down cycle that is the destroyer but it sounds like you were really well prepared and your body was very robust probably before you're going into that can i ask any outs the kit head torch shoes that you used that perhaps somebody that was listening would be like oh i wonder what head torch you used um so head torch i had the silver head torch mm, i heard good um, things about that yeah i i really like it actually and um they come with you can get um like an ultra battery with it mm. so it's like a slightly bigger battery pack i use that my bob grim round yeah it was brilliant oh, did you yeah stayed all night it's awesome yeah it, it was really it was really really good and actually i borrowed a friend's ultra battery pack as well um so i could do a swap for swap um when i met the crew and things like that so I, it was always fresh mm. um so that was my head torch um and then um shoes I I switched actually to uh, oh god I'm about to run Sorconi Exodus. Okay. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So that was because previously I've I've run in Innovates for like years and years and years. Um. But I think I got really nervous and the fact of the distance of it mm-hmm. and the Innovates. Cushioning. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more hard pack. They're great for technical trails and shorter stuff. But I just found that um that length of time in the shoe. I just wanted a little bit more cushioning and I had a couple of friends who had the Sorconi shoes and they were great. They just loved They're them. They're brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I tried them and they were, they were great. I didn't need to change them at all during the race, stayed in them for the whole time. They felt good on the road sections as well. Um, so if you were a Sorconi Peregrine user, uh, 10 years ago, and then they updated the Peregrine and everybody hated them then because they made them 
hard um it, look at the look at those Sakorni exodus because they are pretty similar to the old school peregrines now the grip is really good but they've still got that cushioning around the whole shoe haven't they it's not just yeah. the base they they're like they are really super comfy as well yeah, yours, i'm longing what were the socks that you uh that you wore that you changed? <laughs> so i had um just no oh, what do i have i think i had some innovate socks on at the start um but the 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 beautiful socks um at um Senen were actually i switched into a pair of waterproof Mm, I wonder. Um, I was like, oh, I think I'd have worn waterproof for that whole trail. I don't know why. I'd be like, if I fall in the sea, at least my feet will be dry. <laughs> um, but it was really, it was really nice switching into those because there were. Um, it is a little bit boggy in that, um, in that top section after Senen, and um, so it just gave an opportunity for my feet to dry out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And also because they are the waterproof socks, they're like a little bit thicker, so bit, it just yeah, felt like I was putting them. Yeah, a little bit more cushioning around my feet. Were they Drymax ones? They were seal skins. Seal skins. Oh, were they? Okay. Mm. I've not used seal skins for years. I wonder if they mm. improved. Yes. With it. it sounds like they've improved a lot since I last used them because they were great, but not very comfortable to run in. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't get any blisters or anything like that during the race. Um, I coated my feet in. Um, it's this stuff called trench foot. Which is a oh, name. Gary, we need to get onto this trench foot because yeah, uh, David, stuff. David, who I ran with and was going, oh, you know, I found trench foot, so my feet are so fresh. And is so... it like nut butter? Is it that kind of product? It was a yeah. guy, a guy, yeah, a guy has made it who ran the spine or ran one of these big races and feet fell apart, and then he's gone away and made his own foot I cream, see. basically. So it's a good story. Oh. You like the story, Gary? So <laughs> trench. No, foot. and it seemed to work really well. Um, I didn't take my feet. I. Um, I, yeah, I haven't taken feet in the past, so I didn't want to just start taping them for the race. Um, but yeah, the seal skin socks were good. Uh, to be honest, I haven't tried any other waterproof socks, so I don't know what's good or what's bad. Um, I just, they, if it were in the shop near me, so yeah. I picked them up. Okay, I've got tons more questions that I'd like to ask you about arc and running in general, but we've used up your lunch break, so and I don't want to miss the quick five because that's the best bit of the the interview. But we would love it if perhaps you'll come on again in a month or so's time and talk about Dragon's Back Race with Gary and yes, Trish, who you you are friends with. Trish, our uh, one of our coaches from Brew with the Coaches. Yes. You guys have good (laughs) refuse already. So um, perhaps we can get all three of you on and I can be the person asking the questions and uh, about perhaps your training and planning and stuff and uh, kit planning. We can just scare Gary. Yeah, could we do this earlier than later? I don't want to... A drag is back special in end of uh, <laughs> August when it's too late. Have you not been doing that for months? Yeah, Trisha, we go, oh my God, you're going to be doing Oh my God. <laughs> April, April on me at the latest, please. <laughs> So if yeah, so we've te- we've Robin, we've loved learning all about you. There's so much more that we could talk about, but hopefully that's been helpful for people who are perhaps thinking, you know, the spine isn't the only race. Having seen we've been watched, we were talking this week, Robin, about the spine entry um, system crashing and all the meltdown, the meltdown yeah. from the system and the people that can't get on it. But the arc of attrition yeah, is so there, nice. and um, and is also a super yeah. It's had amazing reviews this year, and it's only going to get bigger and bigger. So thank you so much for sharing our journey. But before we finish, let's jump in the quick five, the real quick nitty gritty. Well, oh, this one's um, on your moral compass, actually, Robin. You're out for a run and you find a £20 note. Do you, <laughs> do you keep it or do you hand it in to the nearest police station? Oh, times are tough. <laughs> like, <Huh>? £20. Pounds. <laughs> um Oh, I don't, if some if there were people nearby, I would ask to see if anyone dropped it. If there was no one around, uh, you know, I think I'd pocket that twenty quid. I can bet. But you how know, much? I'd, to, I'd buy a round of coffees, like after yeah. a run or yeah, something. Yeah, that sounds better. Pass it on. Pass it for nice. I love it. <laughs> nice pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the limit was, though. So if you found seventy pounds, what did oh. you do then? I think you need to make a bit more an effort of trying yeah. to find who lost that. <laughs> or a portion to charity, don't you? Bad. Yeah, portion to charity. Maybe. Yeah. I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Would you keep it? <laughs> Gary, of course he'd keep it. He's oh, yeah, no, I definitely wouldn't keep it. <laughs> 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 I see so it's tricky because uh, you know you could take your police station, but then 
would somebody go to a police station to see if somebody's handed in the money? It's um, I think there is actually if you so you hand it into a police station, but nobody claims it in a certain amount of time, you can go and get it. Oh, I don't think you could walk back in because you can go, oh, that's 70 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance? All right, cool. Uh, your favorite radio station? Oh, oh, um, Radio 2 if I'm at home in Somerset with my family. Radio one, okay. if it's morning and I'm driving to work. <laughs> I just, I just, I exactly. I uh, we listen to radio to like breakfast time with the kids because it's sort of family friendly. And then I've been trying to introduce my teenage son to radio one, saying yeah. like you need to branch out from radio two because you need to be cool. So if you listen to radio one, uh, this is this is cool. This has got like the cool tunes because the, because they don't get that in France. So I'm like, this is what I listen to growing up. And then I put it on. I'm like, I lo- still love it. A bit of radio one <laughs> tunes feel like i'm 20 oh, again no my too old gary my too old i don't like radio one anymore i don't like radio two anymore but uh that's another, that's another do story. you listen to radio do you listen to the radio gary or uh six music i'm gonna listen to six. radio you're so cool yeah. you're so you're so out there <laughs> <laughs> you are on a desert island um and a shipping container washes up and there's only one meal or drink in that shipping container, what would it be? You open it up, what are you hoping for? A shipping container full of? Oh, what, what, one meal? Yeah, one meal um, slash drink. And it's just repeated. <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I could, I like, so I've, I've got a real thing about like eggs and ham. <laughs> so it's just eggs. like scrambled eggs, ham, probably a bit Marmite on there. Um, and, oh, no, not a Marmite fan. <laughs> oh, no, I love Marmite. No, I love Marmite. Do you not like Marmite, Gary? <laughs> nope. Oh, okay. Well, you're not on our day's island, so... Don't yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's... It's, it's what I crave when I get to the towards the end of a run. I start thinking about scrambled egg, and, uh, yeah, it doesn't go until I've had some. Drink of choice. Um, prime. Prime. <sighs> well, I know it's a tea and trails, but it would be coffee. Oh, yeah. It was all going so, so I know. Well. I'm not going to be invited back now, am I? No. It's going to be awkward in that <laughs> tent, isn't it? I always when... get told off for mentioning coffee. <laughs> because it's not part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Next question. No 100 milers this week. It's only a 5K, a 10K, or a half mar- marathon. What would be your race of choice? Half marathon. Yes. Right away. She's back in the game. Back in the game. <laughs> okay, next one. I'm ready Every to write this we... down. <laughs> yeah, I've got to write this down. Every week we uh, share the uh, your episode on Instagram. We'll do an Instagram story, and it's a big help for Eddie and I if we don't have to pick your music. So what song or artist would you like us to use for your Instagram story? Um, I've heard you ask this question before, actually, to guess. So I was, I was thinking about it this morning when I went on my little run. I was like, what music? Love it. Um, so um, there's this song by Luke Coombs. He's a country singer. Okay. And it's called Angels Working Overtime. And one, it was stuck in my head for a lot of that race. Um, and I was like singing it to myself in the dark. Um, but also it's, I don't know, if you listen to the lyrics, it could be a little like thank you to the Archangels um, for for all their work they did. And also thank you to my family. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I reckon that one, I reckon that would suit it. Can we get those lyrics into 60 seconds though? Instagram doesn't give us the you, whole. <laughs> you can get a little clip of it. You, like okay, if you listen good. to it, you'll, want, like, you'll know which little clip to, okay. to pull. Right. Eddie, you're going to get us done for copyright. Pack it in with us. <laughs> It's only a clip. Okay, okay, okay. We had to check it was there before we agreed. One, two, three, four, five. Done. I am done. Thanks, Robin. I love that. Robin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And not only is Robin come on the podcast, but she's also signed up to be a patron. She has got double gold stars today. Her halo, her angel. (laughs) <laughs> her halo is super shining we really look forward to following your journey to drag us back we will be following it very closely you can't get away from us or from gary i'm so sorry about that we can set up a support group if he becomes too much because <laughs> he does but we look forward to chatting you to you again in the next month or so good luck with the recovery don't overdo it keep that tea going in or coffee whatever works <laughs> <laughs> see you soon 
Thanks, Thank Robin. you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Robin, for coming on the show. Uh, good luck with all your future endeavours, especially sharing a tent with Gary. Yeah, good luck. Uh, and we look forward to seeing how you go and how much how much you're going to thrash Gary's butt. At <laughs> He's shaking his head. <laughs> but how cool is it that you're going to have those girls? And I imagine that you probably will. But you would. You would you expect to be around the sort of female top, sort of female three or four? <sighs> It's really hard. Um, someone, you know this, so much can happen. I could trip over and that's it. It's, it's all over with pretty quick. Uh, if, I think that... you're in a, I think with Robin and Trish though, you're in a safe pair of hands. They're really sensible runners. They're not going to hoon off. They're going to, they're going to pace that really well. Yeah. Oh, so I reckon like whatever happens, you're going to have, you're going to have a great time with them. It all depends how beat up I am after Lakeland 100 really. Um, if that was my air race and I didn't have Lakeland 100, then yeah, I'd like yeah, to yeah, be, be like yeah, yeah, I'm there. around that time, but, but honestly, I don't want to be. It sounds like I'm sandbagging, but I just literally want to finish this bloody thing. And um, what would be great from a an experience point of view? I'm not rocking up at ten o'clock at night chasing the cutoffs. Yeah, that's what I'd love. I'd love a bit of camp life uh, to enjoy. It it's but you it's you don't. <laughs> You know. The thing about the multi, yeah, the, the like it's diff, you know, a multi stage that that is three or four hours is quite, you know, it's quite, you do have more time in the afternoon. Yeah. Whereas with Dragon's Back, you know, you're in and you've got to rest. But at least when you're in the tent, the tent chat will be good. Yeah. And I think as well as you approach it like I did the spine, you're out for an adventure and you let the result take care of itself. And if you treat 100%. it as as an adventure, everything else. You know, it just calms everything down. It calms the rush. It calms the process. This is my adventure and nobody else's. Yeah. This week's Tales from the Trails, we've got another poem. Oh, such a creative bunch, these spiners. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and this yeah. week, yeah, Mark Smith now... If you've got a good memory, uh, when I did my roving reporting at Tudale Vellon, I grabbed a few minutes with Mark, and then I did see him at Middleton too, uh, and at Spine Race. So, yeah, a nice connection, a nice thread connecting everything together. And yeah, Mark sent in a lovely poem. And is it my turn to try and read it? Are you ready? Now, I find for the Radio 4 voice, you need to go quite deep, quite, quite smooth, imagine... You're selling a chocolate bar. Uh, but also, Mark has a lovely blog, doesn't he? Which has got other poems on as well. So if you like this poem, you can go and check it out. If I can do this in one hit, this will be amazing. And the title of the poem is called Viva Lasagna. Visions of, <laughs> Visions of girls I never kissed. Feet like Tyson Fury's fists. I paid a thousand quid for this. Viva Lasagna, baby. The dogs at Blee Gate roar their bark. I chip myself, but I can't be asked. Three K more stumbling in the dark. Viva lasagna, baby. All I can think about for now is Alston's legendary chow. My pace has quickened. Lord knows how. Viva lasagna, baby. <sighs> to high cup, Nick. Cauldron snout. This is what it's all about. You're going to need a bigger mouth. Viva lasagna, baby. I can't remember how it tastes. Metabolism set to incinerate. Be careful not to eat the plate. Viva lasagna, baby. From walking, sleep, I'm now restored. Somewhere twixt portions three and four. It's like I never ate before. Viva lasagna, baby. It's time to leave, I'm gently told. I'm sad, a sated grumpy soul. But hark, the angels up the road. Viva lasagna, baby. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a lovely poem. But let's move on from the spine now, because as you were talking about High Cup Nick and everyone, I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Triggering. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Did I stumble? You I did, did so well. Oh, you did, I enjoyed because I hadn't read it, so I enjoyed listening to it. You read it so well. Pat on the back. I hope I did it justice, Mark. Thanks for sending that in. Strava. Strava. Oh my gosh, Strava depresses me at the moment. You have run this through 300 times. This was your slowest version. 
<laughs> I should check out Deepak's uh, Strava profile because I'm really curious what I, what he does because every week he's there or there about crushing the Let's rails or road. I, I want some, yeah, I want some more details on Deepak. Yeah, under normal circumstances, week in, week out, I would say it's probably not good advice to be running 168 miles, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe he's got his um his profiles modeled up when he's cycling or something. I'm not too sure, but wow, Deepak, again, 168 miles and over 25 hours of total training time. That is pretty impressive. But look who's topping the charts for the elevation. Previous guest of the show. Best friend, our best friend. James yeah, Noble. James Noble's crushing it. 15,531 feet. And I wonder, obviously, this will be, are we recording this before everybody's um, trying to enter the 2024 spine race? Um, 20, yeah, 24. God, 24. Jeez. I know, it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, so hopefully, uh, James, and everybody else who wants to enter, uh, is successful getting through the... I hope you all are. I want everyone out. I want everyone to go. <laughs> you all enter. <laughs> yeah 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 Best i shall not be everybody. entering i've had a few questions i shall not be entering have we chatted about this i did think about entering it again and i just wanted to i vocalized that to bryn to go you know i feel like i could do everyone who's done it will know this oh i could do so much better i could do so oh, yes. much better than that and he's like and he's very oh, he's so wise bryn the wisest guy around I was like yeah you'd have a different journey so you can't yeah. compare one year from another so even if you went in and other things went right, other things would go wrong. Everybody who's ever done it will say that. And so he was like, leave it, learn from it, maybe go back to it another time, but not straight away. Go and do other stuff. Yeah. But he did say, he did say, this this is love. If you really want to do it, do it. Oh, it's like, oh, I love it. go through all that again. So it won't be. I won't do it again. I will do it again, maybe one year, but it certainly won't be. It certainly won't be other other exciting. Other exciting things in the pipe. Well, this is it. We're spoiled for choice. There's loads of other stuff out there. And it's, you know, I always think back what Mark Lathwaite said um, when he was referring to the Lakeland 50 and Lakeland 100. Not everybody's journey should be the 100. Um, there's just so many races out there. They don't have to be multi-day dragon's back race or spine race. Um, yeah, and what I'm learning from this recovery from this massive one is that um, that it need you know you need to choose wisely. Choose wisely. So if I chose to do spine again, that would be it. Now I probably wouldn't race again, and it would all be back in there. Back the the tools would all be back in that bucket, and I feel like I want to go and have. Yes, I want to do something mega again, but I want it to be a different experience. Yeah. So. We'll see. But good luck. Anyone who's got that. Gosh, it looks so stressful. When I entered, I just entered. I entered on the day, I think. But... I think it's your fault, Eddie. Your story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what Bryn sent me a message. He sent me the Instagram story of the thing, you know, spine race thing down. And he was like, that's your fault, that is. Well, I just know from our numbers over on YouTube, we've never had a podcast that's been viewed as many times as... Oh, uh... God, I didn't even do my hair, Gary. Look like a right old... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah you painted That's a good really picture nice. over on facebook we've been running a competition along with lecky polls who very kindly offered to send a pair of lecky polls to somebody who we thought well, not deserve them. That's not the right thing to say. But we asked people to post a picture of running with their trail buddies on Facebook. And then Gary and I would choose our favorite. Oh, my goodness. We both made a shortlist and neither of our shortlists met. <laughs> <laughs> some did <laughs> you did um so we did we spent a lot of time we love thank you thank you thank you thank you so much for all your entries we love them if you haven't had a time you know if you're having a cup of coffee scroll through all the pictures i love them all i especially loved a couple of people who took pictures of their friends and falling in bogs that's yeah. my sort of trail buddy <laughs> your friend is got one leg in a bog and all you're doing is laughing we love them all thank you so much to everyone getting involved obviously there can only be one winner um, and so we chose Michaela Korozek, and here is what she wrote. And her picture below is one of her finishing a race with her two boys. Um, and I shall try and pin that po pin that um, entry to the top of the Facebook page so people can see. She wrote, "Initially, I thought, damn it, I don't have any running friends. I can't enter this competition." 
Then I remembered who is there for me every time I run, who cheers for me when I'm trying my best, who joins me on my runs and makes me so, so proud. My little family, my two boys, and my ever supportive husband. And it's a picture of her, as I said, finishing the race with her two boys. Oh, I love it. That's what it, that, to me, of course, that, was, that got me. That got me good. That's what it's all about. Okay, let me get a shout out. You want any running buddies? Let us know where you live. If you want to, there'll be people around, but also perhaps you like running on your own. And obviously, your boys like running with you too. Thank you so much for entering. We will slide into your DMs and find out your address. And a pair of lecky poles will be coming your way. And do share with us a picture of you out storming yeah, around the trail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with those poles. Enjoy using them. I'll send you mine too because I never want to use them. Again. <laughs> I have to say, this has been my favorite competition we have ever done. It was wonderful seeing everybody's pictures. We've got another competition coming up next week with another one of our partners, but we're going to save that until next week. We're going to give you a week off this week. Get you frothing for next week. Thanks again to everyone who follows us over on Facebook, Instagram, our Strava Club. We've got over 700 members over on our Strava Club, so that is, uh, that's grown and grown and grown. One, of, also one, of Facebook... my, one of my aims on that, when I come back to training, I'm going to top the mileage and the vert in one week. <laughs> <A> clean sweep. Draw <laughs> <Destroy> yourself. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. If I ever do well on the Strava Club, it's a happy coincidence where that falls in with my training. Um, I have been guilty in the past of trying to chase these Strava challenges. Uh, but yeah, whatever you whatever you uh, do over on Strava, it's great to have you on board. And also to our Patreons too. I've got to say a big, super big thank you to those guys because they are keeping the mics and the lights on there is a link in the show notes that will take you to all of our various platforms some great perks over on patreon like i said we've got active roots uh five pound off 15 uh pound spends sport shoes 10 percent off and free delivery if you spend 50 pounds and also protein rebel 2 15 percent off site wide i'm really looking forward to I'm trying some protein rebel. I like the uh the ingredients for their gels. It's just maple syrup and sea salt. So that is pretty clean. <laughs> yeah. I might give that to the kids. And they do. <laughs> well, there you if you're not too keen on it running, just pour it on your pancakes on on the, on, on the morning. But yeah, also they do the pea, the plant based protein, and they also do um, which I've never even uh, I'm discovering so much. I didn't realize this thing, but they do their kind of non-vegetarian is cricket based um that's where they get the protein from crickets Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> i'm pretty sure apologies if i want to i want to see you try that. i need to see the ingredients again but i also didn't realize this because when i first started looking for protein and all these supplements i was just a race to the bottom i went to amazon and looked for their cheapest per serving but these other things like Vela Forte and uh, Protein Rebel, they've got like branched chain amino acids. So yeah, they might be more expensive, but it's not really like for like comparison if you're like comparing it to something you might find on a on Amazon or something. But yeah, really excited about that. And if perhaps you're running on listening to this and you know maybe a small local brand or brands on the up and coming, we're really keen to work with people who we want to use their products and would recommend their products to you as well. So if you think of anybody, uh, yeah, let us know and we can approach them and see if they would like to be part of the Tea and Trails podcast. Hey, Gary. <laughs> want to feel good? Want to feel good about oh, yourself? Yes, please. You want yes, to please. Pick up? <laughs> okay, let's do this. Okay, here we go. I'm reading this one. I've already chosen mine. Jamie S, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, inspirational spine queen. You know it. You know it. Episode seven, two hours, 37 of living through Eddie's huge adventure. Very honest, inspirational, extremely emotional from both Eddie and Gary. You were so emotional, aren't we? So moving and gripping felt I was actually running alongside Eddie at times. I have to say when we recorded it, I did relive it as we were recording it. Remember reliving it. So I'm glad that came across. Best podcast I've ever heard. Stop it, Jamie. I will now always look at Robbins in a new way. I know. Would I ever enter the race after listening to this? A big fat no. <laughs> That's the spirit. But my total respect to anyone who does. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for listening and thanks for the shout out as well. You weren't the first person, Jamie, to say that was the best cast, best, best podcast they'd ever this, heard. I mean, I don't want to say this, but, you know, there's been a few things saying like podcast awards, you know, that, you know, some sort of accolade. But Can you imagine just... that? Black tie yeah. event. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Black tie up top, leggings <sighs> down the bottom. Oh, Eddie, can I just 
like you could you protect me i'll stand behind you on the stage <laughs> i don't want to see anything <laughs> give me the mic yeah let's do this <laughs> there'll be no chance of me getting the mic <laughs> you know yeah. in the oscars when they start playing the music when they've spoken too much and they off they usher the person <laughs> You'd be pulling me off going, yeah. Yeah. Stop. it's embarrassing. They don't need to hear that verse of the song. Leave it at the chorus. <laughs> Should we do one more while we're here? Let's do one more. Oh, new listener. I love this. Bones You. New listener. Uh, hi. Uh, I was introduced to your podcast by colleague Thomas Shaw Dunn. I know Tommy Dunn. My goodness me. Uh, really love the podcast. Uh, perhaps made me realize how little I do compared to other people. He was. Thanks for that. No way. You. No, you don't need to do anything if you don't no, want no, to. No. Just listen to the podcast on repeat. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody who does leave us reviews. <laughs> I love reading them. Uh, and as ever, it helps us move up those charts. Number 62, let's get into the top 50. Another jam-packed show, Eddie. Have you enjoyed it? I'm really looking forward to what your week holds over on Starver, and I'll catch you up next week too. Yeah, what have you got coming up? I'm not a plan, Gary, but I am trying to slowly build back um, some movement uh into my life so i'm going to sort my so finally i put an instagram story up this morning my spine kit has all been sorted out into bags it's all been washed but it's still out on the treadmill it's a it's an eyesore it's landfill so i need to sort it all out and then i'm going to move all my weights back into position so i can start doing i feel like like my posture my back i need to get back and do some light weights bit of movement so that's my aim for this week yeah do some pilates get some do some squats just get a bit of tension um get those ligaments and tendons and muscles reminded that they got a job to do uh the kids are on half term for two weeks and they do a ton of ski racing and training so I don't actually have that much time, which is quite good as well, because I'm super, super busy. So I'm going to try and do like 30 to 60 minutes of uh, easy movement and then try and supplement a little bit of mobility and strength as well. I'm nowhere ready to do two sessions a week, which helps me normally in training to get in the training, but no way, no way yeah. ready to do an evening session yet. So just be kind to myself. Keep focusing on good food, good sleep. I am going out one night, Gary. Oh, yes. Yes, jeans on, my, jeans I'm or dress. Put my jeans and smart shirt on, Gary. Oh. <laughs> Woo! I mean, I'm pretty sure I still be in the trainers or the snow boots because there's loads of snow. But yeah, I'm going out with some mates. We're going out for a bit of dinner, maybe a little bit of dancing with some middle aged guys in ski boots. <laughs> Who knows where the night will take us? I is this when? Is it going to be super busy downtown as well? Yeah, so. that's oh. how I like it. Those bars just crammed full of sweaty. So I'm looking at that's that's my one night out of year. So I'm looking forward to that. And the rest will be just half term half term survival. We all know that. What about you? Well, oh. yeah, I've got a race actually coming up, cross country. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really scared about it because I've not run fast for well, apart from those minutes, but they don't poor lungs. really come. Those poor lungs. But Thornley is anybody who does the Northeast Higher League knows that Thornley is the, the course. It, it's it's uh basically it's a working farm, but they take the cattle and stuff off the fields. So the it's oh, either muddy and it's, well, it's a field full of cow. Well, you, yeah, basically, it used to be. But what happens at gates where cows have obviously gone through over over the year? They're just so churned up, so they're either really, really muddy, and you lose your shoe muddy, or if it freezes, then it's just Ooh, ankle slapping. Yeah, it's but it's it's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant course. And for us, Sedgefield, it's our closest fixture. So for us to survive, we really need a good show of numbers out there because Anik is the last fixture and Anik running around Anik Castle ground is beautiful cross country people uh, and it's the last it's the last fixture so a lot of teams get their kind of fast runners out so we don't want to rely on Anik as a fixture for survival we really need to get those numbers on the board at Thorley so that is that and then hopefully I think I've got clearance from uh, Lisa for a, a trip to the lakes on Sunday and I'm going to do it's an old company top recce, and we're going to park in the Langdales, head up to Scarfell Pike, and then basically down to Cockley Beck for people who know the route, and then up to Old Man, old man of Coniston. So it's basically a recce of the last two thirds of the route, which, because obviously the race does get spread out, and 
So from a nav point of view, that's more important. That's where Neil and I lost time, I suppose, last <gasps> time we did it. So we're going to do that. It's about tw- it's good. It's about 20 miles, 21 miles, I think, unless we get lost. Um, and it's over 6,000 feet of elevation. So you're Ooh. three to one on your ratio. So it's a, three to one. You it's love a it. good <laughs> bit of nav and dragons back race training too. Looking forward to that. Thanks everybody for listening. Episode nine, double figures soon. I can't believe it. Uh, continue to run wise, run well. Don't overdo it. And make sure you refuel with tea. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And that was episode nine of Tea and Treads. 